Hello, everyone. And um, I think I should. Um, I do speak Chinese, by the way, but I use English for this talk. And because I see people who probably can't speak Chinese here, so you know. But if you uh, if you want to come back and ask me questions, feel free to use Mandarin. Um, so um, my name is Michael Yuan, and uh, uh, this talk is about um, portable large language model applications in Docker. And uh, uh, I'm the maintainer of CNCF's Wasm Edge project, and I'm also a Docker captain, which is uh, you know sort of like CNCF ambassador, but with Docker, right? Um, so this is an ongoing collaboration between uh, our two projects, Wasmage and Docker. So we gave a first preview of this of this work at AI DevCon in uh, in Paris about a couple of months ago, and there are um, new progress that have made, which I thought was uh, is a really important subject. You know, because um, as you know, uh, CNCF was. Uh, um, Docker was the OG CNCF. You know, some, someone may argue, you know, that the whole cloud native trend was started with, um, you know, containerization and uh, with Docker tools being the first pioneer of that, right? So, um, how do you run large language models in the in, in the new era of large language models? How do we do this with container? And uh, there's different ways to do that. So we uh, we hope to provide a. Uh, overview of how how things are going, and uh, um, you know what are the uh, efforts that have happens in both communities to make to make it happen, right? So, uh, first of all, you know that's um, I I think all of you guys use Docker. Is that correct? You know, is, is there anyone who's not using Docker? Okay, nobody. Okay, a hundred percent. It's great. <laughs> if you look at the developer tools, you know I. I find this quite surprising, you know, because this is a, a Stack Overflow survey. Um, you know, they, they just released this, uh, this result this year. So they release the result every year. You know, the, one of the uh, consistent results is uh, Rust is always almost the most loved programming language. And uh, in the past couple of years, Docker has been pretty high in uh, uh, the most popular developer tools, right? You know, so it's, uh, I'm actually somewhat surprised to find out it's more popular than NPM, you know, because you'd think a lot of, you know, there's, Every single Java developers use NPM, right? Every single Python developers use pip. So you know, there's a, um, you know, so I mean, there's over half of the developers who said that uh, they are already using Docker. So to have the modern um, applications or modern large language applications available in Docker is probably one of the um, uh, most impactful things that that we could do because it's going to affect a large number of developers, right? But before we go to the details of how um, how we um, enable this in Docker, I want to take a step back and uh, um, because I have talked about this a lot, you know, in our booth and when, I, when we talk to people, you know, is the current state for application development in large language model applications. And today, because large language models started almost two years ago with OpenAI, it was the ChatGPT was a HTTP-based web interface. So this mode of development has persisted throughout today. So in the, in the cloud native jargon or in the, in the uh, enterprise architecture, we call this a sidecar pattern, right? You know, so you have some kind of applications that has, um, you know, um, uh, um, you have a large, you have an API server that is running the large language model. So um, it used to be just OpenAI or ChatGPT, and now there's other, uh, you know, uh, cloud providers or centralized providers. And as uh, uh, open source models come along, you have uh, projects like Olama, and then you know, uh, even on Wasm Edge, we have projects called Llama Edge, they, um, and even Llama.cpp. You know, all those open source projects, all those SaaS providers, all those chatbot providers. They all have some kind of HTTP API that allow you to call into the large language model. And this piece of software typically runs on GPU and NPU and TPU arch architecture, right? So it is a separate part that's segmented from the rest of the cloud. And then in the cloud, you have the real application that interacts with the large language model. So um, as time goes on, I think in the past two years, there has been tremendous amount of development uh, around those applications. So those applications, um, you know, the representative framework of those applications, they have, you have LangChain, you have Llama Index, you have those, um, you know, there are lots of frameworks out there. You have DeFi, you know, which is really popular in China, and you have, you know, so 
those applications help you manage the prompts, you know, the system prompt, you know, how do you instruct the model to do things, the workflows, when the model returns some things, how do you handle it, you know, the function calls, sometimes you don't want the model to respond in natural language, but you'd rather the model to respond in code. You know, if I want to do something, just to send me the, say, if I tell the model I want to fly this drone, the model should return a function call, a piece of Python code that can be directly uploaded to the drone and perform the function that I just described, right? Sometimes you want the model to output a valid JSON format in a, in, a, in a certain format or something that has a grammar component to it. There's, um, say, if you have a not large knowledge base, you want to um, you know, uh, build uh, a vector database around it, and uh, you want to chunk the, 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 the text or the knowledge into small pieces so that it can be retrieved later. And once it's retrieved, you can put that into prompts so that the, to reduce the hallucination of the model and to make the model better, right? So there's a... Um, I, I wouldn't go into detail because that's entirely out of the scope of this talk, but there's a huge amount of work that has been done in all programming languages, including Python, JavaScript, Rust, and all that, that's designed to build uh, middleware components that interact with the large language model, right? So those things are typically put in Docker containers, and those things are typically managed by Kubernetes in a CPU-based cluster, okay? So you have this uh, two separate um, uh, components of that made up the entire application. So the, here is the business logic or the application logic, and there is the large language model. And uh, um, like I said, in Kubernetes, we call this a sidecar pattern, you know, that you have application and uh, something else that provides service to, like the database, you know, things like that, that that's, that's provides service to the, to the large language, to the, to the application, right? However, this model is has come under tremendous amount of challenge recently. You know, this, th those tweets about, I think, two years ago, right? You know, that's when Elon Musk took over Twitter. He was very against the whole notion of RP services, microservices, and all that stuff, right? You know, so he's, um, at the time, I think a lot of people predicted that, uh, you know, Twitter would cease to exist. The, the technology infrastructure would, uh, would be completely gone. But two years later, you know, the company has laid off 80% of their employees and uh, reduced most of the services, did what he said, you know, and the, the, the service still exists, right? So that gets a lot of people thinking, you know, is the uh, notion that we need a lot of containers, a lot of services, a lot of sidecars, all connected through HTTP or RPC connections, is that the right architecture, right? So let's set aside, because that's, I think that's very controversial, so we set aside this argument, you know, that's, uh, so maybe in the, in the traditional application, we still need a lot of microservices, but the, the argument I want to make is that in the large language model applications, this sidecar RPC pattern is definitely wrong. Why? Because that promotes an idea that was raised from the architecture pattern of loosely coupled components. Loosely coupled components is great if your, all your components are fairly mature. So you have a database that speaks SQL. You know, and you have, you know, that's, um, the application has a SQL driver, JDBC, ODBC, right? And uh, so you can upgrade them independently. You can upgrade the application uh, without much consideration of what happens on the, on, the, on the database. That's the definition of loose coupling, right? They are not coupled, so you can, they can each be managed and scaled and uh, upgraded separately. However, in the large language model, this is the opposite of the truth, you know? So because the large language model has so many particulars, it's the application has to be built around it. The application cannot be built by the side of it. So I listed some you know, um, uh, important points that um, as an application developer for large language models that we have seen in our community that people have to do. So for instance, you know, the, the version of the model must be tightly matched to the runtime versions. Let's give you an example. So when uh, Microsoft released their new uh, open source model called Phi3, um, there's um, all the previous version of the, say, Lama.cpp, which is a very popular runtime, would cease, to, uh, would cease to work on that particular model because it used a slightly different encoder. So you will need a very specific version of Lama.cpp and going onward in order to use that model. However, from that point on, there was a bug that was introduced that would break the Google's gamma model, okay? So there's no single runtime that can run both models anymore. So just imagine if you have a RPC service that runs by Olama, say, 
you run, you, you upgrade at the runtime, and suddenly there's at least one of those popular models that you can't run anymore. So the model has to be, the, the version of the model and the, quanti the quantization um, level of the model must be exactly matched to the runtime versions. The problem is so severe that um, project llama.cpp have multiple release per day. We're not talking about multiple release, you know, we talk about Linux release, Linux go on stage and said, you know, six weeks per release, that was a huge achievement. The, if you go to llama.cpp GitHub repository, they have at least six releases per day. Each fix a different bug and break something else. Okay, so it's a very fast evolving field. So you know, so the mo model version and runtime version is a huge issue. You know, that's a, it's a, uh, they have to be perfectly matched. You can't say the runtime is loosely coupled with the model. You know, it's there's no such thing. They are, they are very tightly coupled, and different models require very different prompts. So, you know, so um, that's people have discovered the hard way. You know, when um, when OpenAI upgraded from the uh, GPT 3.5 to GPT 4, right? You know, that's uh, the old problem doesn't work anymore because the mo the new model has a new capability to understand new things. So you can do more things, but some of the old things it no longer does. So you know, so each model has its unique prompt templates. How you construct the the, the conversation history. Is it in JSON or is it in some kind of XML format? Each model, when it's trained, has its own specific format. And some models can follow instructions in system prompt better. Some models, you can, you can put a lot of instructions in system prompt. So for instance, you can tell you are a Rust programmer, so now I'm going to ask you to review Rust code. Some model can follow this instruction. Some model can't follow this type of instruction at all, right? You know, so the, the, the prompt have to be tailored to the model. And some models can follow complex instructions and the chain of, reason, chain of thought, chain of reason, some model cannot, right? So the prompt that you, you feed into the model is going to be very different, different, going to differ on the model by model basis. Different models also require different preparations of the knowledge base. Um, to use the, the rack technique is one of the things that I think the most significant innovation advances in, in large language model applications in the recent years. So basically, in order to reduce the hallucination of the model, you, gave, you do not un, uh, rely on the model to recall its own knowledge, but you give it, you, you supplement it with external knowledge. The external knowledge, I'll give an example very quickly. You know, that's, uh, so the, the external knowledge is stored in a vector database. And that vector, how do you prepare that vector database is highly dependent on the model because what is the text size that you can, um, you know, each chunk of knowledge gonna be? Is that 100 words, 200 words, 1,000 words? Can, can you put in a whole chapter of books? into the knowledge base so that it can be recalled later. You know, so different models are gonna ha have very different characteristics when you prepare this knowledge base. So this knowledge base is also tightly coupled with the model. If you say, I want the model A, that's you need uh, the knowledge base to be prepared in a, way, in, in a way that the model A would accept, right? So different models also have very different post-processing responses. You know, so when the model is very good at generating JSON, when it's fine-tuned for that, it's uh, you know it's gonna perform a lot better for say coding tasks or agent tasks. You know, things like that. So when I say all this, is that you know the point I'm trying to make is really the the model the the development model that I showed you in the, in the previous slide is um, I think it's it's good for experimentation. You know, when you have a lot of large language models that you want to experiment, that you want to try different workflows and you know things like that. But it's definitely wrong for production system because production system, you do not build those two side by side. You build, those, you build this stuff around this stuff. It means you have to pull this in here to have the entire application, to have an entire application that's with the large language model embedded in it. Okay, so that when you upgrade, you upgrade the whole thing. If you don't, if you, there's no such thing as you guys can upgrade the model without, without upgrading the framework and the, the workflow, right? So that gives a strong reason to use tools like Docker, right? So large language models are fundamentally tightly coupled. We need to embed the large language model into the application, not put it on the side of it, okay? So that's, if there's one take home points, take away points from this talk, I want you to remember this, okay? And, um, that's really is the original idea of Docker, right? You know, because it's to the developer needs to build something, and when you ship it, you would know the customer can use it, can run it. You know, you can't 
uh, you know, build an application using Longchain and the Llama Index, and then have complex instructions to the to the uh, to the customer to say that you have to set up your vector database this way. You have to have the runtime that B seventeen twenty four. That exact runtime that released on August sixteenth in the afternoon on the GitHub repository of Llama.cpp. You have to download that exact runtime, and you have to download that exact model that works with that runtime, right? So all those things were. Developer have to solve pre-Docker, right? You know, with a container, you know, the container is designed to solve that. So I think, you know, um, to have a new way of containerization around large language model, to have large language model embedded in the container, is one of the, um, you know, I think is one of the most important things that we can do to make those applications truly cloud native. Yeah. So now I want to show you a demo because I think there's enough talking. You know, that's does it work? You know, so it's, uh, you talked about using Docker to package and deliver a complete large language model application. So let me show you. And, um, okay. So the demo is really easy. You know, it's just the two commands. The first is the Docker run command because I already pulled the Docker image. So I'll explain a little when, I, when, it, when it starts up. So I just run this. This is on my Mac, okay? So Docker on the Mac, as you know, it's a, it's a, it's a virtualized environment. Okay, let me, really? Did I forgot to? Did I forgot to stop it? Yeah? Can I, oh, I need to remove it, isn't it? Okay. I think I should. Okay, so this Docker image contains a, 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 a large language model from Alibaba called Chen Wen, right? It's the smallest version of Chen Wen. It's a, so if you look, if you think about Llama three, the smallest version is seven billion parameters. This Chen Wen model only have a half a billion parameter. Okay, and it comes with a knowledge base. What is knowledge? What is knowledge base? The knowledge base is from the official documentation, documentation of the Rust programming language, okay? So the goal that I want to do is that I want to build a large language model that with understanding of Rust because it has the external knowledge base of that. And it would be able to answer questions about Rust. So, and we also have, you know, um, we can build an entire application to help it review Rust code. Actually, we are using setup like this in our own GitHub repository. If you send a pull request into our own GitHub repository, it, uh, a bot would, uh, would, answer, would just review your code and tell you, you know, how, how it thinks things are right or wrong, right? You know, so, so, there's a not, so this, in this Docker image, you have the whole thing about the vector database, the, the knowledge base about, you know, uh, about knowledge about the Rust programming language and a very small large language model. And this, this combination was, um, was chosen on purpose because we want the large language model to have as little knowledge of its own as possible, okay? So if you have a large language model that has a huge number of parameters, like the one that OpenAI has, it has two things. One, it has a lot of memory. It, has a, it memorizes a lot of things from the internet. The second is that it has strong reasoning capabilities because you know um, you just have more neural connections. So um, I think over years people have discovered, <laughs> when, when I say over years, it's only just 18 months, you know, something like that, over the months, past the months, people have discovered you can distill the large language model, a large model into a smaller model while preserving the reasoning capabilities. So the reasoning capabilities does not degrade much, but the, 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 the actual knowledge in the model becomes much less. And that is a good thing because if I ask a model about something about an uh, obscure to uh, topic like a Rust programming language, in all likelihood, if you ask OpenAI this, it's going to answer using Python syntax because it has so much you know, knowledge about Python and how to solve this particular problem in Python. It's going to give you um, highly hallucinated or contaminated results. Right? So by using a very small no uh, language model that by itself, it, it probably doesn't have much knowledge about either Python or Rust but I supplemented it with a Rust knowledge base to build an entire application around it. So the, the, um, if my description show, shows that I chose a model 
and then I built the entire application around the model. The application was built for the purpose of this model, right? It's not, I can't just switch the model to something else. It probably wouldn't work because the, um, because the whole application was built on the, on, on the thesis that I'm going to have uh, the supplemented Python knowledge that fit into the context window of this particular model and then have this model answer Python rela uh, uh, Rust related questions. So, once I, so now that container, you know, as we speak, as the container has started a long time ago. So now, because the container starts a server and map to the localhost 8080, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do localhost 8080 to load it, and then I go to the chatbot interface. You know, it's, the chatbot interface is just for the convenience. You know, that's, um, you know, people, um, you know, that's, um, so, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to ask a question. How it's do I, sorry, convert a string to an integer number? OK. So it goes to the, uh, so the, the Docker application has its own web server and you are and, and, uh, and the HTML pages that's associated with it. So it runs locally. And when I ask this question on my own web uh, on my own web page, what it's gonna do is that it's gonna go to the um, you know, it's gonna go to the Docker application with a large language model and knowledge base embedded in it and ask and ask to answer this question, right? So it happens completely locally and happens, you know, with uh, tailor made for this model. And you can see if, I, if you ask ChatGPT this question, what is it going to tell you? It may give you the wrong, right answer, but it definitely is going to give you the answer in Python. It's not going to give you the answer in Rust. But because this model does not have knowledge about, or does not have much knowledge about the rest of the world, all its knowledge comes from the, the, the Rust documentation that I built into the knowledge base that feed into it, right? So it automatically knows that how do I convert a string to an integer number? That's I'm asking it to generate code in Rust. So it generates well formatted and the pretty okay Rust code, right? You know, so it's, um, you know, so you may wonder, you know, that's uh, the, 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 the turbo past and the, you know, the, you know, wh where did it get its information? Okay, so here it gets the information. It gets, it uses the number five, the number 10, right? You know, that's the Rust documentation that's for public available on Rust Foundation's website. So it takes this piece of knowledge. When I ask this question about how to convert a string into integer, it does a semantic search in the knowledge base and find this text. And then it rephrases the, using its language capabilities and rephrase this text and breaks that into two, um, two parts of the answers, right? So this is, um, so by this example, I, I, I was hoping to demonstrate at least two things, right? You know, the, the first thing really is that um, um, you can use a very small, you can use a very small model and have it answer something that is uh, uh, answer a topic that is actually quite complex. So let me see if I can give me an example of passing JSON into, sorry, into a struct, right? You know, so it takes some time to start because it's, uh, because the model needs to be loaded into the memory. But once it goes into the memory, it's, remember, it's running on my, on my laptop without external um, par, par, so you know the CPU is running at a lower speed, and they're running inside of the Docker container inside of the, inside of the Mac, and because Docker container is not native to the Mac, so it has the the the, the ARM CPU pass through or the or, or the emulation that is not using the GPU at all, and by by choosing a very small model, I can see that the 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 speed that is generated text and generated code is actually I think more than reasonable. You know, it's uh, it's much faster than I can talk, right? So you know, so by having a very small model running locally that I can have say that I can have privacy, that I can have speed, I can have you know all those nice things, and. Uh, 
by supplementing it with the, with the knowledge base that is tailor-made for this particular model, that I can you know, um, have it answer fairly complex questions instead of just, uh, um, instead of just hallucinating some Python answers to me, right? You know, so if I don't have that knowledge base, then you know, that's, uh, it won't, uh, let me tell you, it wouldn't be able to answer those questions, certainly not in Rust. You know? So that's one, um, that's one of the demos I want to show. And uh, uh, this whole project is done by a um, Linux Foundation intern. Um, he's a um, um, uh, last year's uh, college student in India. And uh, so we have a, um, so he's working on the WasmH project and the Linux Foundation pays him for the, for, for the internship. So we tried many different things. If you are interested, you can go to this GitHub issue. You know, so this um, particular issue is just to say, how do I make large language models more knowledgeable about Rust, right? You know, that's, uh, you know, so do I fine tune it? Do I supplement it with external knowledge? Where do I get those external knowledge? How do I construct the, the knowledge base that's, uh, that are particular to the model, right? You know, if I have a fine-tuned model, I may have a different knowledge base, different way of constructing the knowledge base. If I have a, like the Chenwen 0.5b model, I would have another way to give it as much knowledge context as possible, right? So if you're interested, you can, um, you can go to our GitHub and follow this issue. That's, there are lots of discussions in terms of, you know, what he tried and what's, what's working, what's not working, you know, so it's a, uh, um, it's definitely a good learning opportunity for him, but it's also a really good learning opportunity for me as well. So, the um, inside of the Docker container, we have um, we sort of achieved somewhat achieved cross-platform um, portability by having the Wasm Edge runtime as the intermediary be um, you know uh, on top of the the um, you know the native drivers. So you. Um, I wouldn't go into too much depth because I think I'm, I'm a, a little bit running out short on time. But, you know, so WasmEdge is a WebAssembly runtime that can run not only across CPUs, but across GPUs as well. So it has, so if you write an a, a AI inference application, you just write it to the API that provided by WasmEdge. By the way, it's a standard API called WasENN, and it's a, it's a W3C standard. It's, uh, it allows you to interact with um, um, the AI inference engine at a higher level, at a level that above CUDA. WasmEdge translates that function calls into CUDA or into the Mac Metal framework or into whatever the, the, the hardware you are running on and, uh, um, at runtime. So, that's, so, so all those instructions run on the GPU but being translated by WasmEdge. Right? So Llama Edge is a, is a Rust application that built on top of Wasm Edge. So, so we, we write Llama Edge in Rust and then compile that into Wasm to have it running on Wasm Edge and put all those as runtime into Docker container. Right? So that's, however, even with that, even with that compatibility layer, Docker fundamentally is not really portable across GPUs. In fact, it's not portable across, even across CPUs. But you know, the, because we only have really two CPUs, maybe Risk Five is the third. So it not, may not be a big issue. So when you see Docker images, when they publish Docker images, you always see there's different versions. You know, there's ARM version and the, um, you know, the, the x86 version. So it's not really, the problem become uh, much more severe uh, in the GPU world. So those are just uh, some of the GPUs that's available in the marketplace, okay? And uh, if you look at what's happening in, in, in China right now, every single cloud provider has their own AI accelerator. You know, so everyone, I, not, you know, because I'm not a hardware person, not, not I think this must be easy to do, you know, because everyone seems to have one. You know, that's, uh, but even those, you know, you can have AWS have one, you know, that's Intel has multiple, you know, Intel has their GPU standard, has their neural engine standard, has their CMD standard within their CPU, you know, there are lots of, just a lot of stuff. So all those things, um, if you, the, the traditional Docker infrastructure, because it runs native code, you know, so it would be um, a nightmare to have different versions of image for each and different drivers for each of those target um, GPU platforms, right? So, so you know, so as I mentioned, Docker is a great tool to, to package those applications and make them run on the platform that you specify. But there are just too many platforms. So one of the collaborations that we had with Docker is to do Docker plus Wasm, meaning that we get rid of the Linux container altogether. We use the Wasm container, meaning that's uh, Docker acting as the orchestration or the management tool. So when it sees a Wasm application, it just 
runs uh, use the Wasm runtime to run it instead of using the uh, starting a Linux container to run it. That completely bypasses the native layer. But, you know, so that indeed with that approach, you can have cross GPU applications because Wasm is cross GPU. So you can have applications that retain Rust compiled on this Mac and then runs it on the media device. You know. I think we oh, we see that demo in the keynote today with with Quasar, right? You know that's uh, so you know you develop on the Mac and they upload the Quasar and it's orchestrated and and provisioned to a to a media machine and runs there, right? You know because the Wasm provide higher level abstractions than CUDA and Metal. You know that's um, so that's one way to do it, but it's uh, it also has some disadvantages because Wasm is a uh, um, it's not a operating system container. So say if you want to run a database in the Wasm world, you have to have a database that can compile to Wasm. So that means SQLite, you know, things like that. If you want MySQL, MongoDB, and you know, things like that, those, those databases don't compile to Wasm, always take a major effort to compile them to Wasm. So you would not be able to put them into the same container. So we have to go back to square one. It's that we have things that are that's, uh, running on the side, as a sidecar application, that outside of the container, which is something that we don't want, right? You know, we want, we build around the large language model application that has everything um, packaged together in a container. So we have to look for a new way, you know, so that's, so the container got, got us solve some problems. The Docker plus Wasm solves some other problems, and, uh, you know, so they both get us halfway there. And uh, so then what is, um, you know, um, in the Docker community, what are people thinking about how to solve this problem? And one of the angles to solve this problem, you, you know, I think this is still uh, early in the, in the experimentation phase. This is a presentation we did at, uh, at AI Dev in, in, in Paris, right? Is to have a new layer of abstraction in, in Docker, it's called WebGPU. You know, so, okay. so um, you may have heard of WebGPU. The, the first time I, I heard about it, it's also very surprising. It's the same thing. When people tell me Wasm can run on the server, I said, "What? You know, that's uh, isn't that running in the browser? You know, that's uh, it's also the same thing." Twenty years ago, when people told me Java can run on the server, it's the same same reaction. You know, isn't that the applet language, right? You know, so Web GPU is designed to run GPU applications in the browser. So it has uh, a lot of interface with the JavaScript. So you can call GPU uh, functions from the JavaScript, right? Um, but it's not just for the browser because someone provided a standard C definitions for the, for the API, so which would allow it to run outside of the browser, because now you have not only the JavaScript binding, you have the C binding. And in fact, it's also common to compile C-based web GPU application in Wasm, you know, so <laughs> those two worlds start to mesh together, right? You know, so on the server or on the, on, the, on the PC outside of the browser, you can still use web GPU using their C library. And uh, um, so, um, one of the angles that Docker wants to do is to provide in a GPU machine instead of having the NVIDIA container toolkit, you know, whatever, you know, those, those, those elaborate tools. Can't we just build this as a standard feature in Docker? The same way they're going to expose the CPU. It's going to expose the GPU through a, GPU, a web GPU C header inside Docker. So every Docker application would be able to access the GPU through a standard way, right? You know, so that's the new abstraction. And uh, so Docker now have um, I think a couple of employees that we engaged with and also uh, some community members, I think they are really looking for um, people to contribute to this as well, to make the web GPU uh, API available from, out, from inside the containers without extra tooling, right? So if you deploy a Docker container, if it's running on the Mac, it would have the web GPU interface to the Mac, uh, the, the Apple Silicon uh, a GPU. If it's running on Intel, it's gonna have the access to the Gaudi or the, you know, the, the Intel CMD in the CPU. So one of the demos that we gave is, uh, um, is um, running on Wasm Edge. It's uh, um, a Whisper demo, you know, so it's a um, voice recognition um, model. That, so basically, um, you know, it's a very simple Docker file because this is Docker plus Wasm, right? You know, so there's not, no operating system. You don't specify operating system. By the way, I'm talking about things at the top left. Okay, so you know, so there's from scratch the container has nothing, and you copy the model, which is the CFG and MPK file, and the JSON file in there, and then we have a, um, a application written in Rust and compiled to Wasm that reads those files and uh, um, use the WASI interface, which the, the interface I talked about that sits above CUDA and above. Now it's also above WebGPU to run those um, to run those models using the WebGPU API, and then we. We put that into the um, 
into a Docker container and start the container, it will be able to take the, um, you know, um, take the audio file and then uh, spit out the, the uh, spit out the text. So there's a whole explanation of how it's, how to run it with a pre preview release of Docker. I think it's really a nightly build um, that with Web GPU enabled on your own device, right? You know, that's um, you can run it on the Mac and see it's using the GPU. So that's one of the things. And uh, yeah, that's. Uh, um, I think it's from that readme file. So you know, um, um, to just get get into a little more detail is that we compiled um, burn.rs, which is a Rust library for WebGPU, into Wasm, and um, and then have it running inside the inside the Docker container without the operating system. Just the Wasm. Wasm runs on the host operating system, and then use the WebGPU to simulate the the, um, the the GPUs underneath it. Right. So um, I think. I think my time is up, but you know, uh, hopefully, um, I gave you a preview of you know what's happening with cross GPU compatibility, especially in the Docker community. And we have uh, many other efforts that are going on. So, for instance, we are working with uh, the Container D. Um, and, um, we are working with the CRON plus uh, Podman group to um, to enable GPU support on you know on, on workloads that are running on CRON. Right, you know, because CRON also has direct Wasm integration, so the same setup can, can run CRON. And we, you know, but when the worst comes to worst, today, even today, what you can do is to put Wasm into a Docker container and at least have the application that has the correct architecture, that has built the application around the large language model instead of by the side of it, right? You know, so, yeah, that's, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. And, yeah.